the committee will be in order. President Trump's pressure campaign against state officials existed in all the key battleground states that he lost. But the former president had a particular obsession with Georgia. Here is the president on the afternoon of January 6th, after his own attorney general warned him that the claims you are about to hear are patently false. They should find those votes. They should absolutely find that. Just over 11,000 votes, that's all we need. They defrauded us out of a win in Georgia. And we're not going to forget it. So the state of Georgia is where we will turn our attention to next. I want to emphasize that our investigation into these issues is still ongoing. As I stated in our last hearing, if you have relevant information or documentary evidence to share with the select committee, we welcome your cooperation. But we will share some of our findings with you today. Secretary Rassenberger, thank you for being here today. You've been a public servant in Georgia since 2015, serving first as a member of the Georgia House of Representatives and then since January 2019 as Georgia's Secretary of State. As a self-described conservative Republican, it is, is it fair to say that you wanted President Trump to win the 2020 election? Yes, it is. Mr. Secretary, many witnesses have told the select committee that election day, November 3rd, 2020, was a largely uneventful day in their home states. In spite of the challenges of conducting an election during a pandemic, you wrote in the Washington Post that the election was, quote, successful. Tell us, what was your impression of how election day had proceeded in Georgia? On election day in November, our election went remarkably smooth. In fact, uh, we meet at the GEMA headquarters, that's the Georgia Energy um, uh, Emergency Management Association uh, meeting location, but we were following wait times in line. In the afternoon, our average wait time was three minutes statewide that we were recording for ver various precincts, and it actually got down to two minutes. And at the end of the day, we felt that we had a successful election from the standpoint of the administration and the operation of the election. Thank you. The chair recognized the gentleman from California, Mr. Schiff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Raffensperger, did Joe Biden win the 2020 presidential election in Georgia, and by what margin? Uh, President Biden carried the state of Georgia by approximately 12,000 votes. And Mr. Secretary, as I understand it, your office took several steps to ensure the accuracy of the vote count in Georgia, reviewing the vote count in at least three different ways. These steps included a machine recount, a forensic audit, and a full hand recount of every one of the five million ballots cast. Did these efforts, including a recount of literally every ballot cast in the state of Georgia, confirm the result? Yes, they did. We counted the ballots where the first tabulation would be scanned. Then when we did our 100% hand audit of the entire, all five million ballots in the state of Georgia, all cast in place, all absentee ballots, they were all hand recounted and they came remarkably close to the first count. And then upon the election being certified, President Trump, because he was in within half percent, <coughs> excuse me, could ask for a recount. And then we recounted him again through the scanners and we got remarkably the same count. Three counts, all remarkably close, which showed that President Trump did come up short. Nevertheless, uh, as you will see, the president and his allies began making, began making numerous false allegations of voter fraud, the false allegations that you and Mr. Sterling, among others, had to address. Mr. Sterling, uh, thank you also for being here today. Following the 2020 election, in addition to your normal duties, I understand that you became a spokesperson to try to combat disinformation about the election and the danger it was creating for elections officials, among others. In a December 1 press conference, you addressed some of your remarks directly to President Trump. Let's take a look at what you said that day. Mr. President, it looks like you likely lost the state of Georgia. We're investigating. There's always a possibility. I get it. And you have the rights to go through the courts. What you don't have the ability to do, and you need to step up and say this, 
is stop inspiring people to commit potential acts of violence. Someone's going to get hurt. Someone's going to get shot. Someone's going to get killed. And it's not right. I, I, it's not right. Mr. Sterling, what prompted you to make these remarks? Mr. Schiff, we had had a previously scheduled press conference that day as we were in the habit of doing, trying to be as transparent as we could about the election and the counts going on. Um, a little after lunch that day, uh, lunchtime, I received a call from the project manager from Dominion Voting Systems who was oddly, audibly shaken. She's not the kind of person I would ex assume would be that way. She has a master's from MIT, a graduate of the Naval Academy, and was very much on the ball and pretty unflappable. And she informed me about a, a young contractor they had who had been receiving threats um, from a, a video had been posted by some QAnon supporters. And at that point, we had been sort of been steeping in this kind of stuff. So we were, it was around us all the time. So I, I didn't take note of it the more than adding to the pile of other stuff we were having to deal with. And I did pull up Twitter and I scrolled through it and I saw the young man's name. It was a particular tweet that, for lack of a better word, was a straw that broke the camel's back. Um, had the young man's name. It was a very unique name. I believe it was a first generation American. And it said, had his name. You committed treason. May God have mercy on your soul with a slowly twisting gif of a noose. And for lack of a better word, I lost it. I just got irate. Um, my boss was with me at the time, the Deputy Secretary, Jordan Fuchs, and she could tell that I was angry. I've turning, I tend to turn red from here up when that happens, and that happened at that time. And she called Secretary Raffensperger to say, we're seeing these kind of threats, and Gabe thinks we need to say something about it. And the Secretary said yes, and that's what prompted me to do what I did. I lost my temper, but it seemed necessary at the time because it was just getting worse. And I, don't, I could not tell you why that particular one was the one that put me over the edge, but it did. Now, after you made this plea to the President, did Donald Trump urge his supporters to avoid the use of violence? Not to my knowledge. Now, as we know, the President was aware of your speech because he tweeted about it later that day. Let's take a look at what the President said. In the tweet, Donald Trump claims that there was, quote, massive voter fraud in Georgia. Uh, Mr. Sterling, that was just plain false, wasn't it? Yes, sir. Nevertheless, the very next day, on December 2nd, President Trump released a lengthy video again making false claims of election fraud in Georgia. Let's take a look at what he said this time. They found thousands and thousands of votes that were out of whack, all against me. In fact, the day after Donald Trump released that video, so now we're talking just two days after the emotional warning that you gave that someone's going to get killed, representatives of President Trump appeared in Georgia, including Rudy Giuliani, and launched a new conspiracy theory that would take on a life of its own and threaten the lives of several innocent election workers. This story falsely alleges that sometime during election night, election workers at the State Farm Arena in Atlanta, Georgia, kicked out poll observers. After the observers left, the story goes, these workers pulled so-called suitcases of ballots from under a table and ran those ballots through counting machines multiple times. Completely without evidence, President Trump and his allies claimed that these suitcases contained as many as 18,000 ballots, all for Joe Biden. None of this was true. But Rudy Giuliani appeared before the Georgia State Senate and played a surveillance video from State Farm Arena falsely claiming that it showed this conspiracy taking place. Here's a sample of what Mr. Giuliani had to say during that hearing. And when you look at what you saw on the video, which to me was a smoking gun, powerful smoking gun, well, I don't, don't have to be a genius to figure out what happened. And I, I don't have to be a genius to figure out that those votes are not legitimate votes. You don't put legitimate votes under a table. No. <laughs> Wait until you throw the opposition out and in the middle of the night count them. We would have to be fools to think that. President Trump's campaign amplified Giuliani's false testimony in a tweet pushing out the video footage. Giuliani likewise pushed out his testimony on social media 
As you can see in this tweet, Mr. Giuliani wrote that it was, quote, now beyond doubt, unquote, that Fulton County Democrats had stolen the election. Later in this hearing, we'll hear directly from one of the election workers in this video about the effect these lies had on her and on her family. Mr. Sterling, did the investigators in your office review the entire surveillance tape from the State Farm Arena on election night? Uh, they actually reviewed approximately 48 hours going over the time period where action was taking place at the um, counting center at State Farm Arena. And what did the tape actually show? Depending on which time you want to start, because as was mentioned, this conspiracy theory took on a life of its own, um, where they conflated a water main break that wasn't a water main break and throwing observers out and a series of other things. What it actually showed was Fulton County election workers engaging in normal ballot processing. Um, one of the specific things, one of the things that was very frustrating was the so-called suitcases of ballots from under the table. If you watch the entirety of the video, you saw that these were election workers who were under the impression they were going to get to go home around 10, 1030. People are putting on their coats. They're putting ballots that are prepared to be scanned into ballot carriers that are then sealed with tamper-proof seals so that you, they can, you know, they're not messed with. Um, and the, it's an interesting thing because you watch all, there's four screens of the video, and as you're watching it, you can see the election monitors in the corner with the press as they're taking these ballot carriers and putting them under the, under the table. You see it there. Uh, one of the other hidden ones, if you looked at the actual tape, was on the outside of the table just from the camera angle. You couldn't see it originally. And this goes under the no good deed goes unpunished. We were told that, that we were at GEMA, as the secretary pointed out, and we were, under the, we were told that it looked like they were shutting down with Fulton County counting. The sec secretary expressed some displeasure at that because we wanted to ke everybody keep counting so we could get to the results and know what was, what was happening. So our elections director called their elections director who was at another location because this was election day. There was two different places where ballot things were being done by the Fulton County office. Um, so he called the elections director of Fulton, then called Ralph Jones, who was at the State Farm Arena and said, what the heck are you doing? Go ahead and stay. And as you watch the video itself, you see him take the phone call as people are putting things away and getting ready to leave. And you can tell for about 15, 20 seconds, he does not want to tell these people they have to stay. He walks over, he thinks about it for a second, you see him come back to the corner of a desk and kind of slumps his shoulders and says, okay, y'all, we got to keep on counting. And then you see him take their coats off, get the ballots out. And then a secondary thing that you'll see on there is you'll have people who are counting ballots who a batch will go through, they will take them off and run that through again. What happens there is a standard operating procedure that if there is a misscan, if there's a misalignment, if it doesn't read right, these are high speed, high capacity scanners. So three or four will go through after a misscan. You have to delete that batch and put it back through again. And by going through the hand tally, as the secretary pointed out, we showed that if there had been multiple ballots scanned, Without a you know, corresponding physical ballot, your counts would have been a lot higher than the ballots themselves. And by doing the hand tally, we saw two specific numbers that were met. The hand tally got us to a 0.1053% off of the total votes cast and 0.0099% on the margin, which is essentially dead on accurate. Um, most academic studies say on a hand tally you'll have between 1% and 2%, but because we use ballot marking devices where it's very clear what the voter intended, it made it a lot easier to us for us to conduct that hand count and show that none of that was true. Now, I understand that uh, um, when you reviewed these tapes uh, and did the analysis, uh, it disproved this cons conspiracy theory. Um, but you still had to take a lot of steps to try to make sure the public knew the truth about these allegations. Uh, and you did frequent uh, briefings for the press. Let's take a look at one of those press briefings, uh, Mr. Sterling, that you held on December 7th. Uh, to make the point that you just did today. Move on to what I'm going to call Disinformation Monday. It's out of the gate. Um, many of y'all saw the videotape from State Farm Arena. I spent hours with our post-certified investigators, uh, Justin Gray from WSB, spent hours with us going over this video to explain to people that what you saw, the secret suitcases with magic ballots, were actually ballots that had been packed into those uh, absentee ballot carriers by the workers in plain view of the monitors and the press. And what's really frustrating is the president's attorneys had this same videotape. 
they saw the exact same things the rest of us could see. And they chose to mislead state senators and the public about what was on that video. Um, I'm quite sure that they will not characterize the video if they try to enter into evidence because that is the kind of thing that could lead to sanctions because it's obviously untrue. They knew it was untrue and they continue to do things like this. Mr. Sterling, despite the efforts by your office to combat this misinformation, misinformation by speaking out publicly and through local media, you were unable to match the reach of President Trump's platform and social media megaphone spreading these false conspiracy theories. What was it like to compete with a president who had the biggest bully pulpit in the world to push out these false claims? For lack of a better word, it was frustrating, but oftentimes I felt our information was getting out, that, that there was a reticence of people who needed to believe it, to believe it because the President of the United States, who many looked up to and respected, was telling them it wasn't true. Despite the facts, and I have characterized at one point it was kind of like a shovel trying to empty the ocean. And yes, it was frustrating. I even have you know, family members who I had to argue with about some of these things, and I would show them things, and the problem you have is you're getting to people's hearts. I remember there's one specific, an attorney, that we know that we showed and walked him through, this wasn't true, okay, I get that, this wasn't true, okay, I get that, this wasn't, five or six things, but at the end he goes, I just know in my heart they cheated. That's just, and so once you get past the heart, the facts don't matter as much, and our job, from our point of view, is to get the facts out, do our job, tell the truth, follow the Constitution, follow the law, and defend the institutions, and the institutions held. Let's take a look at what you were competing with. This is former, the former president speaking in Georgia on December 5th. Evidence of fraud is overwhelming, and again, I'm going to ask you to look up at that very, very powerful and very expensive screen. Hidden cases of possible ballots or rolled out from under a table. Four people under a cloud of suspicion. So, if you just take the crime of what those Democrat workers were doing, and by the way, there was no water main break. You know, they said there, there was no water main break. That's 10 times more than I need to win this state. 10 times more. It's 10 times, maybe more than that, but it's 10 times more because we lost by a very close number. In this committee's hearing last Monday, we heard from senior federal law enforcement officials, um, from the senior most uh, federal law enforcement official in Atlanta at the time, U.S. Attorney for the Northern District, B.J. Pack, as well as former Attorney General Bill Barr. They both testified that the allegations were thoroughly investigated and found to have no merit. Here is U.S. Attorney Pack. They go to Attorney General Barr. I told them that we looked into it, we've done uh, several things, including uh, interviewing the witnesses. I listened to the, the tapes and reviewed the uh, videotape myself, and that um, there was nothing there. Um, Giuliani was wrong in representing that this was a uh, suitcase full of ballots. And here's what Attorney General Bill Barr had to say about the same allegations. Took a look, hard look at this ourselves, and based on our uh, review of it, including the interviews of the key witnesses, uh, the Fulton County uh, allegations were had no merit. We also have testimony from senior Department of Justice officials establishing that they specifically told President Trump that these allegations had been thoroughly investigated and were completely without merit. Here is Acting Attorney uh, Deputy Attorney General Richard Donahue describing a phone conversation in which he specifically told President Trump that these allegations were false. The president kept fixating on this suitcase that supposedly had fraudulent ballots and that the suitcase was rolled out from under the table. And I said, no, sir, there is no suitcase. You can watch that video over and over. There is no suitcase. There is a wheeled bin where they carry Where they carry the ballots. No matter how many times senior Department of Justice officials, including his own attorney general, told the president that these allegations were not true, President Trump kept promoting these lies and putting pressure on state officials to accept them. On January 2nd, 
the President had a lengthy telephone conversation with Secretary Raffensperger. Prior to the President's call, though, I want to share a bit of important context. First, the White House, including the former President's Chief of Staff, Mark Meadows, repeatedly called or texted the Secretary's office some 18 times in order to set up this call. They were quite persistent. Second, Chief of Staff Mark Meadows took the extraordinary step of showing up at a signature audit site in Georgia, where he met with Secretary Raffensperger's chief investigator, Francis Watson, who was supervising that audit process. Behind me is a photograph from that visit. Third, the day after Meadows' Georgia visit, he set up a call between President Trump and Francis Watson. On the call between President Trump and Georgia investigator Francis Watson, the former president continued to push the false claim that he'd won the state of Georgia. Let's listen to that part of the conversation. You know, it's just, you have the most important job in the country right now, because if we win Georgia, first of all, if we win, you're gonna have two wins. So you're not, they're not gonna win right now, you know, they're down. Because the people of Georgia are so angry at what happened to me, they know I won, won by hundreds of thousands of votes, it wasn't close. And in this next clip, he told this state law enforcement official that she'd be praised if she found the right answer. Hopefully, uh, you know, I will, when, when the right answer comes out, you'll be praised. I mean, I don't know why, you know, they, they made it so hard. They, they will be praised. People will say, great, because that's what it's about, that ability to check and to and to make it right, because everyone knows it's wrong. There's just no way. Mr. Raffensperger, I know you weren't on this call, but, uh, but that you have listened. And the Republican congressman ended up getting 33,000 more votes than President Trump. And that's why President Trump came up short. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, the president uh, on this call doesn't stop here. Uh, let's listen to another part of the conversation between President Trump and Ms. Watson. Whatever you can do, Francis. This is the President of the United States calling an investigator looking into the election in which he is a candidate and asking her to do whatever you can do. Mr. Secretary, he placed this call to your Chief Investigator on September 23rd, 2020. The Select Committee has received text messages indicating that Mark Meadows wanted to send some of the investigators in her office, in the words of one White House aide, a shitload of POTUS stuff, including coins, actual autograph MAGA hats, etc. White House staff intervened to make sure that didn't happen. It was clear at the time of this call that the former president had his sights set on January 6th. Listen to this portion when he told Francis Watson about a very important date. Do you think they'll be working after Christmas to keep it going fast? Because you know we have that date of the 6th, which is a very important date. That important date, of course, was the joint session of Congress, where Georgia's electoral votes would be counted for Joe Biden. A little, a little over a week after this call to Francis Watson, the President was finally able to speak with you, Secretary Raffensperger. Bear in mind, as we discuss this call today, that by this point in time, early January, the election in Georgia had already been certified. But perhaps more important, the President of the United States had already been told, repeatedly, by his own top Justice Department officials that the claims he was about to make to you about massive fraud in Georgia were completely false. Mr. Secretary, the call between you and the President lasted 67 minutes, over an hour. We obviously can't listen to the entire recording here today, although it is available on the Select Committee's website. But we'll listen to selected excerpts of it now so that we can get your insights. Let's begin with the President raising the thoroughly debunked allegations of suitcases of ballots. 
in an official uh, voter box. They were in what looked to be uh, uh, suitcases or trunks, uh, suitcases, but they weren't in uh, in voter boxes. Uh, the minimum number it could be, because we watched it and they they watched it certified uh, in slow motion, instant replay, if you can believe it. But they had slow motion and it was magnified many times over. And the minimum it was was 18,000 ballots, all for Biden. These are the allegations that the Department of Justice, the Attorney General, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, and your office had all said were false. Is that right? Correct. And even more importantly, when B.J. Pack resigned as U.S. Attorney of the Northern District, President Trump appointed as acting U.S. Attorney of the Northern District, Bobby Christine. And Bobby Christine looked at that, and he was quoted in the AJC, that he found nothing. And he dismissed that case early on. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. The President references suitcases or trunks. Uh, Mr. Sterling, were the objects seen in these videos suitcases or trunks, or were they just the ordinary containers that are used by election workers? They're stand standard ballot carriers that allow for seals to be put on them so they're tamper-proof. Uh, and finally, the President claims that there was a minimum of 18,000 ballots somehow smuggled in all for Biden. I take it, uh, gentlemen, that that was also categorically false? There's no, A, there's no physical way he can know who those ballots were for, but secondarily, we had, Fulton County for years has been an issue in our state when it comes to elections. So we had, they had a very difficult time during the primary, in large part because of COVID. So we had put them under a consent decree, the secretary got negotiated, where we had a monitor um, on site. And his name is Carter Jones, and he took a notation he had gone from State Farm to the English Street Warehouse to look at election day activities, but before he left the State Farm Arena, he noted how many ballots had been counted on each one of the machines. And when he came back, after we found out they were working again, he, he took note again when they closed. And I believe the final number was something around 8,900 total ballots were scanned from the time he left to the time about 12.30 or 1 o'clock in the morning. So way below 18,000. Uh, let's play the next clip. I heard it was close. I said, there's no way. But they dropped a lot of votes in there late at night. You know that, Brett. Mr. Secretary, did somebody drop, drop a lot of votes there late at night? No. Uh, I believe that the president was referring to some of the counties when they would upload, but the ballots had all been accepted and had to be accepted by state law by 7 p.m. So there were no additional ballots accepted after 7 p.m. Let's play the next clip in which uh, the president makes claims about so-called dead voters. The other thing, uh, dead people. So dead people voted. And I think uh, the, the number is in the pro uh, close to 5,000 people. And they went to uh, obituaries. They went to uh, all sorts of methods to come up with an accurate number. And a minimum is close to about 5,000 voters. So, Secretary, did your office investigate whether those allegations were accurate? Did 5,000 dead people uh, in Georgia vote? Uh, no, it's not accurate. And actually, in their lawsuits, they allege 10,315 dead people. Uh, we found two dead people when I wrote my letter to Congress that stated January 6th, and subsequent to that, we found two more. That's one, two, three, four people, not 4,000, but just a total of four, not 10,000, not 5,000. Let's play the next clip. And there's nothing wrong with saying that, you know, uh, that you've recalculated because uh, the 2,236 and absentee ballots, I mean, they're, they're all exact numbers that were, were done by accounting firms, law firms, etc. And even if you cut them in half, cut them in half, and cut them in half again, it's more votes than we need. Mr. Secretary, is there any way that you could have lawfully changed the result in the state of Georgia and somehow explained it away as a recalculation? No, the numbers are the numbers. The numbers don't lie. We had many allegations, and we investigated every single one of them. In fact, I challenged my team, did we miss anything? They said that there was over 66,000 underage voters. We found that there was actually zero. You can register to vote in Georgia. When you're 17 and a half, you have to be 18 by election day. We checked that out, every single voter. They said that there was 2,423 non-registered voters. There was zero. They said that there was 2,056 felons. We identified less than 74 or less that were actually still on a felony sentence. 
every single allegation we checked, we ran down the rabbit trail to make sure that our numbers were accurate. So there's no way you could have recalculated it except uh, by fudging the numbers? The numbers were the numbers, and we could not recalculate because we had made sure that we had checked every single allegation. And we had many investigations. We had nearly 300 from the 2020 election. Mr. Secretary, you tried to push back when the President made these unsupported claims, whether they were about suitcases of ballots uh, or that Biden votes were counted three times. Let's play the next clip. President, they did not put that. We, we, can, we did an audit of that and we proved conclusively that they were not scanned three times. Yeah, Mr. President, we'll send you the link from WSB that does I, I don't care about a link. I don't need it. I have a, I have, a much, Brad, I have a much better Mr. link. You told the president you would send him a link from WSB, which I understand is a local television station that had a uh, unedited video from the State Farm Arena. But the president wasn't interested in that. He said he had a much better link. Uh, Mr. Secretary, at the time that you were on the call with the president, as we have shown, both the FBI and the Georgia Bureau of Investigation had proven these claims to be nonsense. And you told him about these investigations on the phone. Let's listen to what President Trump had to say about the state and federal law enforcement officers who conducted, who investigated these false claims. There's no way they could find, then they're incompetent. They're, they're either dishonest well, they or find? incompetent, okay? There's only two answers, dishonesty or incompetence. There's just no way, look, there's no way. But the president didn't stop at insinuating that law enforcement officers were either dishonest or incompetent. He went on to suggest that you could be subject to criminal liability for your role in the matter. Before I play that portion of the conversation, I'd like to show you something that the president retweeted a couple weeks before your call with him. Here's the president retweeting a post from one of his allies, a lawyer who was later sanctioned by a judge in Michigan for making false claims of election fraud. Let's take a look at that tweet. The tweet read, quote, President Trump, at real Donald Trump, is a genuinely good man. He does not really like to fire people. I bet he dislikes putting people in jail, especially, quote, unquote, Republicans. He gave at Brian Kemp, Georgia, and at Georgia Secretary of State every chance to get it right. They refused. They will soon be going to jail. So on your call, this was not the first time the president was suggesting you might be criminally liable. With that, let's listen to this portion of the call. I think you're going to find that they are shredding ballots because they have to get rid of the ballots because the ballots are unsigned. The ballots are, are corrupt and they're brand new and they don't have seals. And there's a whole thing with the ballots, but the ballots are corrupt. And you're going to find that they are, which is totally illegal. It's, it's, it's more illegal for you than it is for them because you know what they did and you're not reporting it. That's a, you know, that's a criminal, that's a criminal offense. And, and you know, you can't let that happen. That's, that's a big risk to you and to Ryan, your lawyer, that's a big risk. Secretary Raffensperger, after making a false claim about shredding of ballots, the president suggested that you may be committing a crime by not going along with his claims of election fraud. And after suggesting that you might have criminal exposure, President Trump makes his most explicit ask of the call. Let's play a part of that conversation. So, look, all I want to do is this. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more than we have, because we won the state. Mr. Secretary, was the President here asking you for exactly what he wanted, one more vote than his opponent? What I knew is that we didn't have any votes to find. We had continued to look. Uh, we investigated, like I just shared the numbers with you. There were no votes to find. That was an accurate count that had been certified. And as our General Counsel said, there was no shredding of ballots. Mr. Secretary, after making this request, the President then goes back to the danger of having you deny these allegations of fraud. Let's listen to that part of the clip. And I watched you this morning and you said, uh, well, there was no criminality, but I, I mean, all of this stuff is, is very dangerous stuff. It's, when you talk about no criminality, I think it's very dangerous 
for you to say that. Secretary Raffensperger, you wrote about this in your book, uh, and you said, quote, I felt then and still believe today that this was a threat. Others obviously thought so too, because some of Trump's more radical followers have responded as if it was their duty to carry out this threat. Please tell us what you, your wife, even your daughter-in-law experienced regarding threats from Trump's more radical followers. Well, after the, ele after the election, uh, my email, my cell phone was doxxed, and so I was getting texts all over the country, and then eventually my wife started getting the uh, text, and hers typically came in as sexualized uh, texts, which were disgusting. You have to understand that uh, Trish and I, we met in high school, and we've been married over 40 years now, and so um, they started going after her, I think, just to probably put pressure on me, why don't you just quit, walk away? And so that happened. And then some people broke into my daughter-in-law's uh, home, and uh, my son has passed, and she's a widow, and uh, has two kids. And so we're very concerned about her safety also. And Mr. Secretary, why didn't you just quit and walk away? Because I knew that we had followed the law and we had followed the Constitution. And I think sometimes moments require you to stand up and, and just take the shots when you're doing your job. And that's all we did. You know, we just followed the law and we followed the Constitution. And at the end of the day, President Trump came up short. But I had to be faithful to the Constitution. And that's what I swore an oath to do. During the remainder of the call, the former president continued to press you to find the remaining votes that would ensure his victory in Georgia. Let's listen to a little more. Why wouldn't you want to find the right answer, Brad, instead of keep saying that the numbers are right? So look, uh, can you get together tomorrow? And Brad, we just want the truth. It's simple. And, uh, and everyone's going to look very good if the truth comes out. It's okay. It takes a little while, but let the truth come out. The and the, tr the real truth is I won by 400,000 votes, at least. So, wh so what are we going to do here, folks? I only need 11,000 votes. Fellas, I need 11,000 votes. Give me a break. Four days after the president's call to Secretary Raffensperger was January 6th. The president whipped up the crowd in front of the ellipse, once again promoting the allegation that Secretary Raffensperger, the president's own attorney general, had told him was false. Here he is on the ellipse. In Fulton County, Republican poll watchers were ejected, in some cases physically, from the room under the false pretense of a pipe burst. Water main burst, everybody leave, which we now know was a total lie. Then election officials pulled boxes, Democrats, and suitcases of ballots out from under a table, you all saw it on television, totally fraudulent, and illegally scanned them for nearly two hours, totally unsupervised. Tens of thousands of votes. This act coincided with a mysterious vote dump of up to 100,000 votes for Joe Biden, almost none for Trump. Oh, that sounds fair. That was at 1.34 a.m. Mr. Secretary, Mr. Sterling, I want to thank you for your service to the state of Georgia and to the country. Um, Speaker Bowers, likewise, I want to thank you for your service to the state of Arizona and to the country. You have served not only your home states, but our nation and our democracy. Mr. Chairman, uh, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Schiff. I thank the witnesses for joining us today. You are now dismissed.